Welcome to Answers That Count. If you own a business, you can count on us to give you the answers you need to succeed in all aspects of your business. And now, here's your host, Charles Musgrove. Hey, this is Charles Musgrove. Welcome back. We got a great episode here on Answers That Count. We have something very exciting today. We're going to be talking with Professor Joe Calhoun, Professor of Economics at Florida State University. So uh, this is going to be really good. We've got his book. Joe, Joe's on the screen, so give us a wave right now, Joe. So we have his book. He's co-author on this book. It's called Common Sense Economics. So we're going to start this uh, today. We're going to go through these. He's got these great uh, 12 key elements of economics we're going to talk about today. So we're going to, in this session, we're going to talk about uh, the first one. So Joe, welcome to the show. This is not your first time on Answers That Count, but welcome back. Well, it is great to be back, Charles. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, it, this is uh, this is going to be good, and um, I like where you're at. You're outside. It looks like you're out in the pool area. That's that's uh, great. Yes, I'm trying to enjoy the outdoors. I've been cooped up sitting in front of my desk for months now, so it's it's good. We got some great weather here in Florida, and it's nice to get outside and do something a little bit different and get away from uh, my kitchen table where I've spent many hours the last few months. I, I hear you. So uh, give us a give us an update on what you're seeing for uh, for Florida State today. Is is uh, you know you and I've been on on several of these shows, and we like to say the date and the time that we're doing the show because so much happens so fast. So we are July 31st. And it's around 12:30 uh, Eastern time. So, what's the latest at Florida State as far as in-person classes and what you see as far as the education? Well, so far, Florida State plans to open as scheduled. Our first day of classes are Monday, August 24th, and we're looking forward to having as many students come back to Tallahassee as are willing. The unfortunate part is uh, most of our classes are going to be remote and online. Now we're doing a mix of synchronous and asynchronous, which means sometimes students have to call into a Zoom at, at a specific time. Other times they can just kind of work on their own somewhat independently. But uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 80% of the total number of courses at Florida State for the fall semester are going to be remote online. The other 20% or so are going to be in person. Now, what we don't know is how many students are actually going to move back to Tallahassee. That's just a wild guess at this point. Uh, you can imagine some students say, hey, you know what? I'm ready to get out of mom and dad's house, and I don't care if all my classes are remote. I'm moving to Tallahassee. Other students are going to say, well, if all my classes are remote, I'm just going to save a little bit of rent money, and I'm going to stay at home with mom and dad, and, and I'm going to do all my classes remotely. So we won't know exactly uh, how many students come until they actually come, and then we'll just kind of go around and, and get an idea in the neighborhood and on campus. Uh, but we're going to be open for business uh, as scheduled on August 24th. Wow, that's a whole nother economic discussion on what happens to these uh, university towns because you know Florida State is not by itself and how they're going to do that. That's probably going to be pretty much in the norm of what we see across the across the nation at the universities. Yeah, and every college has a, a, a very interesting mix with their community and Florida State is no exception. I mean, you have all kinds of businesses in town that thrive on those student consumers being here and when they're not here it poses a real challenge for them so florida state and the community are very much a partner in many different aspects of life certainly economic life and it is going to be fascinating to see how these businesses can survive and if they can survive uh, hopefully they can limp through the fall semester without uh, having to go bankrupt but unfortunately that may be the case for some of these and, and I'm not wishing that upon them I certainly want them to be around uh, but a lot depends on how many students are actually in town and from their point of view the more the better yes yeah, man it is uh, Joe you don't know how many conversations I've had with business owners that are in heavily impacted industries the restaurant hospitality industry those guys are really suffering and this plays right into it because at least as far as Tallahassee, and I'm sure that's in, in many, many, probably most college towns, that hospitality industry thrives so much on the college football scene and, 
and even, oh, and yes. even the professionals. So if you take that away, man, those those guys are just they're crippled. And uh, so many of the businesses, they they their whole this like Christmas is their Christmas season is football season. So if you take away yeah. Christmas from a retailer, then you know they they basically function the rest of the year at a break even. Some of them even at losses, so they can make their money during football season. And you take that away, and it's just really depressing to think about it. Yeah, and the ACC announced that uh, they're going to uh, an 11-game schedule uh, with one out of conference, but then with all the other Power Five conferences saying they're not doing any out of conference, you just wonder how that's going to impact schools like Florida State, who thought they were going to get one more game, but maybe because the rest of conferences say no, Florida State will lose that game. So we might be down to ten just because we can't find another opponent. Right. But the more the, the more broad issue is absolutely college. Uh, uh, football drives a lot of economic activity in uh, schools uh, for schools like Florida State and uh, we're talking about millions of dollars at stake and and hopefully we can have something close to a 10 game season if not a lot of businesses are going to be completely devastated and FSU itself will be devastated with millions of dollars of lost revenue yeah it's it's um man it just creates a such a ripple effect in in uh throughout the business world. I mean, <clears throat> we, we got, my wife and I were reading a note today from the boosters on what they're expecting on capacity for for the end game. And it's, uh, I think they're looking at 20, 25%. So you're looking at around 20,000 people in the stand. So, uh, man, that's just, if you think about a seating capacity of 80,000 down to 20,000 and what that's gonna be like, it's, it's uh, and then you think, yeah, of, and, then, and then the experience itself. I mean, yeah. you know, we, we, you know, we've unfortunately we've we've had you know the history of FSU. We we've had some games where uh, attendance was really low, and I've been at a few of those games, and it is just not the same from a fan experience. I mean, if you're sitting there in an eighty thousand seat capacity stadium and there's only twenty or twenty five thousand people there, it just feels a whole lot different. And quite frankly, it's not as much fun yeah so uh, there are real issues and then you know for the home teams they're going to lose some of that home field advantage because the crowd isn't going to be as into it and it's not going to be as loud so there's so many dynamics that change here because of the capacity issues yeah so true and it's uh you know you think about 20 it's funny we talk about uh capacity and i don't know that i've talked capacity so much as recently with these uh like restaurants so you know they're at 50 percent capacity and and now we're talking about 20 percent 25 percent capacity on the on uh, attendance at football games and and you think about the the business model that was initiated when those businesses started and if you look at at a football stadium as a as a business environment that that's one way to look at it so those those business models are not set to design. They're not designed to be to work at twenty five or fifty percent or even seventy five percent of capacity. That I mean, that, they just they they're not set up to to be profitable like that or to survive like that. So it's it's such it presents such a challenge to uh, just not not thriving but just surviving let's survive this this yeah we've, of time. we've already seen that play out i mean you know the weeks ago the state of florida told restaurants that they can have some in-person dining capacity but you've actually seen very few restaurants actually act on that because they said it is not worth our while it is way too costly to have 25 percent seating capacity it's better for us to still just close down the dining room and do drive through and curbside only yeah so we've seen that evidence by the actions of businesses who've been given the permission but they're smart enough to realize that's not in my best interest so they haven't been doing it yeah exactly and it's uh you know, I've had some uncomfortable conversations with with uh, with clients during this time, and and those in, that are in the bar and the lounge industry, I was having a conversation the other day. This was with uh, with someone who had closed their business, and I said, you know, it, it, I feel extremely bad for you that you had to make that make that decision. However, I said your decision was probably made easier because you couldn't open. I said, yeah. if, if you were in a position where you could you could open at 50 or 25 or 75 percent capacity, 
that would have been a much more difficult decision because it, you're kind of in a straddle the fence. Let's give it a try. However, you know your model's not set up to, to be profitable at that limited capacity, and that, that's a harder decision to go through, whereas the bars and the lounges, if, if they can't open, they may it may be an easier decision that they can't just, they can't remain ready to open. They, they don't have the stay in yeah. power for that, so the closed decision is, is an easier decision. It's not, it's not easier is, is such a probably inappropriate word, but the decision process, you got, you got fewer variables to consider. Yeah, every now and again, we do like to be told yes and no. You know, yeah. you, you think about, you know, a, a parent acting on behalf of their child. I mean, you know, yes, sometimes we like to empower children to say yes or no. Um, uh, but other times a parent has to say the answer is no or the answer is yes. And sometimes that does, like you said, makes things a little bit easier just from a, a stress and mental point of view that, you know what, I kind of would like to, but somebody above me in a higher authority says I can't. Right. And therefore, you're just being the bearer of bad news. You're not the one who actually made that decision. That's right. So in some respects, that does make it a little bit easier. Uh, but yeah, I still feel bad for all those businesses who are going through that kind of trauma right now. It's it's really an unfortunate time to be a business owner and having to make some of these decisions and then see the impact on your employees. I mean, that, that's got to be the really hard part, too, when you have to tell your employees, listen, you can't come to work and I can't give you a regular paycheck or I can't give you a paycheck at all. That's got to be really hard conversation to have. Yeah, those are there's a lot of businesses having those conversations. So let's uh let's jump to i think it's it's probably an easy pivot there's just probably a lot of crossover in in the book and the things that we're going to talk about now so i yeah. want to give you this these few seconds to uh promote your book i mean tell me you're you're listed on here with some great people also and you're another great person uh that's listed as as authors of this book yeah, well, let me first of all make sure that uh, I give a shout out to my co-authors. This book is in its third edition officially, and this was all started by my good friends and mentors, Jim Gortney and Rick Stroop. They did the first edition, and it was really more like a pamphlet than it was a book. When you when I look back at that first edition, it's a whole lot thinner. And, uh, and then over the years, they added uh, another good friend of ours, Dwight Lee, uh, who I was with at the University of Georgia when I was doing my graduate work. And then we added Tawny Ferrini onto the cover, and she did a lot of great work with the personal finance. And then for the third edition, the authors decided to bring me on board uh, to do a little bit of writing. But quite frankly, uh, most of my work for the project was outside the book. It was on the curriculum and getting this uh, into schools and across college curriculums. So uh, I did have a small hand in doing the revision to the third edition, but a lot of my activity has actually been in stuff outside the book. We put together three courses surrounding the book for high schools and for colleges, and I've been very instrumental in that. But I'm very proud uh, to be listed as an author with uh, my great colleagues who have been doing this uh, for a long, long time. Yeah, it's 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 a great book. So uh, pick this up. I'm sure you can get this book at all your places that you. Oh yeah, it's available it. all the online places. I I think if you want to buy a hard copy, it's less than twenty five dollars, and there's electronic versions that you can get for a whole lot cheaper. And basically, the way I like to think about the book is it's broken down into four parts. The first three parts are all economics, and we're going to go over part one today about the twelve key elements. And then uh, parts two and three are, are more about economics. And then the last part, part four, is actually one of my favorites because that's my new passion in life, and that's all about personal finance. And these are just some practical tools that everybody should use and learn about practical personal finance. So I, I'm really proud of that, that fourth part of the book. Uh, so three parts economics, one part personal finance, and then we think you'll be on your way as a reader to enjoying life and making smart decisions and building wealth as you go through these decision-making processes. Good. I like it, and uh, this thing's set up great to uh, for us to talk through these. And uh, we're on part one right now, and that's the 12 key elements of economics. So uh, those are those are simple they're common sense and let's start out with the first one incentives matter changes in benefits and cost will influence choices in a predictable manner 
This is what's referred to as the basic postulate of economics. And for a lot of people, this is where economics and psychology really overlaps because this is trying to understand the general question about why do people do that, whatever that is. And we can fill in you know, a lot of different uh, phrases and decisions for that. Uh, in economics, you know, we typically think about people going to the store as a consumer and buying things. We think about them going to work and collectively we call them the firm and how do they do what they do and why do they do it. And then if you go to the government, you know, we call you a, a politician or a government bureaucrat and you make decisions there. So why do you make the decisions that you do there? So it's really about just understanding a little bit of the psychology that's involved with us making decisions. And the basic postulate says that when a decision becomes either easier or more beneficial, you will do more of it. And when something becomes more costly or more difficult, you will do less of it. So this is very intuitive. Most of us have understood this since we were little kids. Uh, you know, as parents, you know, we, we, we play these games all the time. You know, hey, kids, if you eat your vegetables, you can have ice cream for dessert. Right. I mean, that's really what we're capturing here. And then as life progresses, you know, decision making becomes much more complicated than I eat my green beans and I get, you know, chocolate cake for, for dessert. But the basic positive is still there. When something becomes more valuable, or at least perceived to be more valuable, people are going to be more likely to do it. And if you make something more difficult for somebody, they're going to be less likely to do it. So what I remind my students is if you want to understand people, just look at the incentives that are surrounding them, and you can probably figure out a lot about why people are doing things because they're responding to the incentives around them. And I also stress to people the incentives are many times non-monetary. Yes, we like to measure things. We can measure time in terms of money. You know, you can take a, an hours of your work and say, I get paid $25 an hour. Okay, so we can measure it in dollars and cents. But really, most of our incentives in life don't have a monetary value. You know, we talk about social status. Uh, you know, as a young person, you respond to grades. As a student, we respond to food. We respond to all kinds of things. And those are very important and many times more important than the paycheck that we get at the end of the week from our employer. Yeah. So we need to think very broadly here in terms of these incentives. Yeah, I think that's uh, that, those are great points. And it's you know, a lot of people value their their time or their their free time more than they do any any monetary benefit they get from their job or their vocation. So that that's important to know that there's more than just a money driver in the incentives. There's other other things and tangibles that that affect that that decision or the incentive. Oh, sure. Just you know, general happiness. However, you want to define happiness. Right. You know, you think about think about the immense pleasure and benefits you get from spending time with your family and friends, sitting down and reading a good book, a time at the beach, a time at a football game, you know, those things, those are hugely important. And some people say, you know what, I don't care how much money you give me, I'm not giving up a weekend with my kids, or I'm not giving up my bike ride this uh, afternoon because that is extremely valuable to me. Well, you're not writing a check when you go on that bike ride, you're not giving up any money, but yet that is very important incentive. You're going to respond to either me giving that to you or me potentially taking that away from you in a very predictable way. Right. Think about that also. Touch on this in that the incentive. So, you know, we, and I don't want to make this political, but there's there's uh, incentives drive people's how much they work. So, Part of the mm -hmm. incentive is the profitability they make from what they do. And you can also factor into that the the taxes that are charged. So you're gonna you're gonna be more motivated if if the reward is greater. So the reward Absolutely. is the reward is basically what you're left with at the end. And the end is after you pay your bills, after you pay your taxes, etc. So taxes tax payment is one of the largest payments that anybody makes. So if, if yes, so and, and we've seen this play out over history. I mean, if you go back 
to when the income tax was passed in 1913, and if you look at the changes Congress has made, there have been so many changes. Those tax rates have gone sky high, and then they've come back down. It's been a roller coaster, and people respond to those incentives. So let's go back to the late 1930s when the highest marginal tax rate, that is for upper income people, if they earned one more dollar, the marginal tax rate was 94%. Wow. That means of that additional dollar, 94 cents went to the government and only six cents went in their pocket. Now again, that's the marginal rate. That's not on every dollar, that's just the last dollar that they earn. But that has a very predictable effect on people's attitudes towards work and their willingness to work. Just imagine we implemented that policy today. What would be your incentive to try to work harder, to get a raise, the, the incentive to work longer hours, if you knew that if you earned one more dollar, 94 cents of it went somewhere else and only six cents went in your pocket? Yeah. Not going to be very me, great. I'm saying, you know, hey, it's not worth it for me. That extra six cents is not worth it. So I'm not going to do that. So we need to be very careful with our tax policy to make sure that we're not destroying the incentive to go to work in the first place. If you make it too costly, people won't go to work. They'll yeah. find something else to do. Yeah, and if you if you uh, overlay that on the percentage of taxpayers that make up the revenue base for for uh, tax dollars that that even <laughs> that even has a bigger exponential effect. So that that uh, you may you may deter those those that are contributing to the tax revenue. So that if they reduce that, it even has a more dramatic effect on on the economy as a whole as a whole. Yeah, yeah, that's what's referred to as the tax base, the, the amount of people who are actually working, or if it's a sales tax, the amount of things that are actually buying it. So it's, it, you know, the, the tax revenue is a simple mathematical formula. It's the, the number of sales, or if you're going to do payroll, the number of hours worked times the tax rate. So you have to have two things. And obviously, if any one of those go to zero, then the revenue goes to zero. So you can have a really high rate, but if there's no activity, well, that's the zero, and then your revenue is zero. And we, we need to remember that there's two parts to that equation. That's right. And there's all, that's always been the argument or the, the positions from the, diff, the two different parties. Either increase the rate so you get a higher per person, or you, you, you lower the rate and you increase the incentive for people to work and motivate and you get more spread across more people yeah yeah and, and there is uh th there is a relationship now unfortunately we don't have a solid mathematical relationship because it does change over various times but there's this thing called the laffer curve which tries to match out the relationship between the rate and the revenue and what the laffer curve indicates and in a general level there's portions where there's a positive relationship you increase the rate and you will increase the revenue but then there's other portions where it's just the opposite and policymakers have a hard time finding that sweet spot because if they raise the rate too much then the base and the revenue goes down and of course we don't want to do that so there's a lot of political disagreement and quite frankly a lot of mathematical disagreement about exactly where does that relationship hold for increasing the rate and increasing the revenue and uh, of course there's been lots of studies on this but we don't have a final conclusion we don't we can't always say well put the rate right there that's the magic spot because that changes over time given our dynamic economy that we live in good 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 hey we're going to uh wrap up this session but before we before we close up i wanted to uh Give a give give a shout out to the Laffer curve. That's Art Laffer, right? Is that yes, that? Arthur Laffer. Yeah, that's not Laffer as in you know. Hey, that was really funny. Right. Uh, L a f f e r. That's uh, after the gentleman that you appropriately named Arthur Laffer really came into prominence in the late 1970s in uh, in regard to tax policy. Right. Now, but was he, what was his involvement with? Uh, he was pretty heavily involved with Reagan, right? Yes, he was very involved in the Reagan administration, and one of the uh, leading scholars that convinced Congress at, in the early 80s to lower 
the tax rates such that we could hopefully increase tax revenues and the data clearly show that was the case for that time period that when uh, Congress reduced the rates uh, several times in the early 1980s it wasn't just one it was over the course of a couple of different modifications to the tax code but very clearly uh, we can see the historical evidence support that when those rates came down the revenues went up dramatically as a result good that's some great information and we're going to wrap up this session and this was number one incentives matter so we kind of took a a dive into the economics and what it looks like in our in the political landscape as well so uh, a lot of good history there joe thank you so much for for that information very welcome thank you for joining us for this session hey we're going to do we're going to go through all 12 of these and uh I think we can do that pretty quickly, but we're going to do one at a time and we'll look for those at least once a week. So uh, stay tuned. Check us out on Answers That Count podcast. We're on all the all those podcast channels that you normally get your stuff. We're on YouTube. So go subscribe to it, like it, and check back with us for more economic discussion with our buddy, our friend, Professor Joseph Calhoun with Florida State University. Thank you, Joe. Have a great day. Have a blessed week. And we'll Thank talk you. to you great next to week, buddy. Here. All right, man. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Thanks. Answers That Count is brought to you by the Bean Team. For all your business accounting needs, visit beanteam.com for more info. You can listen to more episodes of Answers That Count on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and iHeartRadio, or visit AnswersThatCount.com.